All right, so we're recording. All right, should we go ahead and start, with, start off with the introduction? Yeah, welcome everyone uh, to the magic of Arctic birding. Uh, this is being presented by Tyler Ficker this evening. Uh, it's a program on birding barrow in Nome, Alaska. Um, I'm Brian Zwiebel, one of the owners and uh, photo leaders for Saberwing Nature Tours. And Tyler's going to hit the next button here for me. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Tyler. Uh, he's received his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Wildlife uh, Science from Ohio State in the spring of 2020. Uh, he's the former president of the OSU Ornithology Club. Uh, he is a birding and photography guide uh, for us at Saberwing Nature Tours. And he's also an excellent portrait uh, and wedding photographer and does some amazing graphic design, as you can see from the logos uh, below there. Uh, so again, welcome. Uh, sit back and enjoy Tyler's program. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks again, everyone, for coming out. So this presentation is going to be a tour of Alaska. So we're going to, we're going to go through what it's like to bird both Barrow and Nome, Alaska. And this first map is just a little bit of a route uh, showing what, what the trip looks like from Columbus, Ohio, where I'm currently based. And as you can see, uh, it's pretty straightforward to get to Alaska. And then once you get up there, it gets a little, a little confusing to get around uh, the way that the flights work. You stop quite a few times just to get to one location. But the first stretch of this trip is going to be to Barrow up here. It's the northernmost city in the United States. Barrow is a small little town of 4,400 people uh, located right on the Arctic Ocean here. And here's a little overview of town. Um, it's mostly, mostly natives uh, that live there. And there are some, some businesses and everything based up there because it is the capital city of that county for Alaska. And once you're out birding in Barrow, uh, this is pretty much the scenery that you're met with. It is a lot of vast expanses of tundra. There's not a tree within hundreds of miles of town. Um, the tallest vegetation that we found, we, we jokingly call the uh, Barrow, Barrow State Forest is only three or four inches tall at most. And uh, when you're around town, not necessarily the most uh, striking of scenery. It's, there's not really many places for, for people to dispose of stuff and the weather conditions are a little bit intense and wear on everything. Uh, so the exteriors of a lot of buildings and vehicles are pretty worn out, um, but they do have a lot of nice amenities. Like this museum here is actually very nice and very pretty on the inside. Um, great restaurants and lodging around as well. Uh, so looks are deceiving with this town when you're there. One of the more popular tourist attractions uh, straight out of the airport is a sign showing you the relative distance of how far you are to a lot of the major uh, cities around the world. So you can actually see that you are closer to Paris, France than you are down in certain parts of Florida. And you're only 1,300 miles from the North Pole at this point. So you're pretty far north. Um, around town you find a lot of old boats and everything. Uh, this boat happens to be located next to Barrow's biggest tourist attraction, the Bowhead Whale Arch. This is made from the lower jaw bones of a bowhead whale that was hunted in town. And this archway is pretty much the spot to get your photo taken when you're up there. It's, it's an iconic spot uh, in Barrow. But to get around Barrow, um, the roads aren't really a whole lot either. Because of the fluctuations in temperature being so extreme, you get, you get quite a lot of freezing and thawing, uh, which is not very good for the asphalt and it doesn't last. So the roads are just, just dirt roads that are cleared out of the tundra and they're constantly being refilled as the snow melts and erodes away some of these, some of these uh, big potholes. One of the coolest things about getting to be in Barrow, especially for photography, is that during the summer you have 24 hours of light. So you can see the timestamps on some of these photos taken at midnight or this building on the right being taken at three in the morning. You have great light all the time and it makes things uh, very nice. Uh, you don't really have to worry about limiting, limiting yourself on that. Uh, however, certain weather conditions um, allow it to be pretty hazy the whole time you're there. So this is a little more typical of what, um, what the conditions might look like at a particular time, but you can get both of those 
both that as well as nice clear skies in a given day. And while when you look at this photo, you're seeing a lot of this brown uh, tundra grass, but when you look at it up close, it's a very intricate, uh, beautiful landscape made up of short grasses and lichens, mosses, as well as some exposed rock as well. And it's a very spongy ground and makes for some beautiful settings for birds. It complements a lot of the colors of many of the common species. So that being said, I'd like to go over some of the more common species of each of the, of barrow, just so that when we get into talking about what makes it special, you're familiar with these species. So a species that can be a little bit tricky uh, to find if you're based in the Midwest, scanning the Great Lakes, becomes a little more common on the, on the coast is long-tailed duck. Um, oftentimes we see long-tailed duck in their black and white plumage. Uh, they have a pretty striking winter plumage. However, they change completely to look like this when they're up on their breeding grounds. And they're probably the most abundant duck that you'll find uh, on the tundra up in Barrow. Another familiar face is northern pintail, is another very widespread uh, duck, not near as widespread as the long-tailed duck in my experience, but still relatively plentiful. Another species that, for those of you in the east, uh, may involve a little bit of tracking them down, scanning through large groups of Canada geese. Uh, out west, you might find some larger numbers. Greater white-fronted goose is the most common goose species found up there, <clears throat> and is very widespread uh, everywhere you go. Uh, Pacific loon is relatively common down here in the lower 48, especially over on the west coast and uh, occasionally strays in, into the Midwest and onto the east coast. Uh, Pacific loon changes to look like this stunning bird here uh, for its breeding season and can be found on a lot of the ponds around Barrow. Uh, Barrow doesn't tend to have a whole lot of raptor species around. Um, you have a couple owl species, uh, such as short eared and snowy owls. But your main uh, predator birds are both parasitic Jaeger here and Pomeran Jaeger. And they're actively scouring the, the tundra in search of these little guys looking for brown lemming. This bird is the main food source for both of these Jaegers, short deer owl and snowy owl. Um, also, a lot of birders are intimidated by the idea of identifying gulls. Uh, thankfully, when you're in Barrow, you don't really have to worry too much because almost every gall you see is going to be glaucus gall. And the ones that aren't glaucus gall are likely going to be savin gulls. And that you can see the, those two species look pretty different and make it very easy to tell the difference between the two. You also have Arctic tern present as well, which is the longest migration route of any bird species, migrating from the North Pole to the South Pole and back every year. The willow ptarmigan, which if you've never taken the time to look up the call of this bird, I highly recommend it. It is probably one of the funniest bird calls in the world and you, you will not regret taking the time to look this up. This bird is pretty amazing and uh, we had quite a, quite a cool encounter with him and I'll, I'll tell more about that later. Uh, songbird diversity is not, not great in Barrow. Um, when you're in town, there's quite a lot of snow buntings, which again, look beautiful in their breeding plumage. That, nice black and white makes them stand out a lot when they're up on the snow. Lapland longspur is one of the more common birds as you get out of town and more into the tundra itself. A couple other species that are around are savannah sparrow and hoary redpole are both uh, possible as well but aren't, aren't as uh, widespread as the snow bunting and the longspur. Um, probably my favorite thing about barrow are the shorebirds. Getting to watch shorebirds uh, display is amazing, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in, a, in just a minute. But some of the more common uh, shorebirds, some of which are familiar faces down here, are semi-palmated sandpiper, dunlin, pectoral sandpiper, long-billed dowager, buff-breasted sandpiper, western sandpiper, American golden plover, and both red phalarope and red-necked phalarope. Now, it wouldn't be fair to talk about Barrow without addressing the, the stars of the tundra, the main reason that people are drawn up to this area, and that's the king eider, the spectacled eider, and the stellar's eider. Both spectacled and stellar's eiders are very range-restricted species, and this is the best place to see them 
And it's actually one of the few places that you can see all four eiders. And to quote what Brian uh, has told me is that people come to Barrow to see the eiders and they stay for the shorebirds. And we'll get into that uh, here when we talk about what makes the tundra magical. What is, what is this magic of the tundra? The reason the presentation is called the magic of Arctic burning. And it's because everything that you get to experience up there is unlike anything that you regularly see down here. Oftentimes people are familiar with shorebirding as here in the fall when a bunch of young birds are passing through, you're out scoping your local mud flats or checking the beaches or reservoirs, uh, hoping to get some distant views of shorebirds so that you can identify them well enough. Um, however, up, up in the tundra, you can actually identify every shorebird without ever seeing it because the shorebirds are displaying and they're very vocal. It's a totally different characteristic than, than we get to see down here. Uh, such as something like long-billed dowager. Dowagers are notoriously difficult to identify down here when they're migrating through. But long-billed dowager up there is, he will get up onto the highest point he can find and just call and call and call and likes to make themselves known, which is very different than we're used to seeing with shorebirds that are typically skittish down here. Um, even the waterfowl starts to display. If you'll watch uh, a few female stellar ziders and all the males will gather around her and they'll all throw their heads back and start bobbing their heads like this male here is doing. A uh, long-tailed duck actually does something similar, although uh, this female doesn't appear to be near as interested in him uh, as he would probably like her to be. But back to, back to the shorebird um, display, you get these really unique characteristics, uh, such as this buff-breasted sandpiper where it's one of the few lucking shorebirds and a lucking species is one where all the males will congregate in one area so that they can display against one another and try to try to show off all the females are going to be nearby watching the males are all competing in the middle. Um, you've probably heard of this with like prairie chickens and sage grouse out west but uh, buff breasted does that as well. So here is actually two males competing They'll, they'll do this uh, behavior where they'll raise their wings in the air and they'll wave their wings to try to gather the attention. And then they'll throw both of their wings up like this bird on the left. And then the females will come up and actually huddle up in these, in these open wings and, that's, and they'll inspect the plumage of this bird and that's how they select their mate is who, has, who does this whole process the best. Um, just a few of these displays here. Semi-palmated sandpiper will hover in the air calling for minutes at a time uh, not not changing position at all. Uh, here's that wing up display we talked about with buff breasted sandpiper, and Dunland's actually doing something similar. And at the end, I'll have a date, but Brian's giving a a presentation on shorebird behavior specifically, and it it's amazing. I highly recommend that you go if you want to see more about this type of stuff. Um, so the reason that people want to bird barrow in the early summer when they do is that all these tundra ponds thaw. Most of the time there's just everything's frozen over and the ground is hard, there's not much opportunity. But as these tundra ponds thaw, uh, then all these birds suddenly have areas for them to go and display in, stage in, and nest. So this time of year the Arctic Ocean is still relatively frozen, but as this uh, as this thaws, these leads in the water and close allow migratory birds to start coming coming in from the ocean back towards land and they'll start congregating in these ponds before they even head into the tundra. Um, that being said, when the ocean is frozen over this much, it does attract some other visitors as well. Um, you'll have to take my word for it, but there actually is a polar bear way out there. And this was seen on, our, on my first trip up there uh, two or three years ago now. So as this, as this all falls, the polar bears will head out away from town a little bit more. As these ponds thaw though, uh, like I said, you'll start to see these species congregating, uh, such as all these redneck phalaropes who are actually a shorebird that spends its winters out in the ocean. Uh, it's one of the few pelagic shorebirds that in red phalarope are. And so all these little guys will come back in and they'll start pairing up uh, males and females in these ponds and eventually will head off to their own little areas to nest. Uh, waterfowl species uh, begin to do the same. Because uh, these long-tailed ducks, these were the same as the displaying bird before. Found a nice little pond that they stayed in together and they likely ended up nesting on that pond. Uh, Pacific loons will nest uh, just about 
any pond that they can find that's big enough. This was actually a little pond behind the high school that had had this loom. The spectacled eiders are starting to pair up. King eiders are pairing up. And the buff-breasted sandpiper has, continues to display and attract all these females in. Um, another, another thing other than just getting to witness all this amazing behavior, the, the other appeal of Barrow is that you get these unbelievable encounters with these birds. It's not just getting to see something very cool at a distance. This is all happening right in front of you. You get to go out into the tundra and get close to these birds. Uh, they're so set on displaying and there's not really a whole lot to predate on them, so they're not really too concerned about you. You're not really, you very rarely actually stress these birds out being out there, and as long as you're careful, then they're going to be just fine with you being out there. Uh, the photo on the left, I'm actually standing up to my chest in water to take the photos of those specific loons that I showed a few slides back. And they they really don't care that you're there. They're, they may be a little curious and check you out, but other than that, they'll go right back to doing their thing. Getting to get into these ponds, uh, such as um, this photo of my client from last year, you're able to get very, very cool photos that are different than you ever get to see anywhere else. They're much more up close and personal encounters. Rather than sitting there with a scope scanning for dowagers, you're up close getting headshots of these birds. You're in the water with this loon here. This king eider swam right past me and almost, almost, uh, almost flew right past my head. But getting these up close uh, encounters with these things, these headshots, uh, this to me is just a much more personal way of, of photographing these birds, of learning about them, and really just getting to connect with that and the environment that you're in. And it's, it's truly something that you, you don't really see elsewhere. So to, to end Barrow, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to end on one story here with this, this Willow Tarmigan. It was our last day on my first year up there. And we were driving around and we'd, we'd seen a, a ptarmigan fly by. So we stopped and uh, the bird was, the bird was act, like actively rolling around the dirt. Once they've mated, then the bird's trying to get rid of that white plumage as quick as it can. So it just rolls around the dirt trying to dirty it up so it doesn't stand out as much anymore because it, it wants to be able to hide. And we were sitting there watching this bird and he kept calling, coming right up to us. And then he would run away. And then if we, we would just sit there and then he'd come running back to us, call and then run away. And so eventually we, we look up and he was running towards this Jaeger that was circling out over the tundra. And we couldn't figure out what he was doing, like why he kept doing that. And as we got close enough, uh, the, Jaeger, the Jaeger realized we were there and the Jaeger flew off and immediately the bird calmed down and walked back, just walked away from us and stopped calling. And right then uh, the female popped up. So this bird was, was trying to draw us over uh, to actually to drive the Jaeger away so that the Jaeger would leave this bird alone, or, um, possibly leave a nest alone. We, were, we didn't actually see if there was a nest nearby. But that right there, like just those types of encounters are what make that area so special. And again, it's just unlike anything I've seen anywhere else. Hey, Tyler, can I jump in and play the Willow Tarmigan call? Yeah, absolutely. So this, so that call right there is the sound that we were actually getting to hear, um, right, right in front of us with, with this bird, uh, oops, this bird here. He was getting right up in our faces, often too close for us to even photograph, uh, and just kept doing that call over and over, and it was truly fantastic to get to hear that in person. I've, I've heard that, uh. I've heard that like on on CDs when I was younger and first getting into birding. Um, never thought I would get to hear it like that. And it was truly amazing. So, so the next uh, the next stretch of this trip here is flying back to Fairbanks by or back to Anchorage by way of Fairbanks, and then from Fairbanks you fly north up to Cottsview, which is this dot up here, and then from Cottsview south down to Nome. And this is because uh, the flights up there just run regular loops. Um, because a lot of people are traveling for work between the cities because a lot of these towns are like oil towns and because of that the planes just run these loops and try to hit as many cities as they can so oftentimes allowing for several stops on your way to get to one destination 
Nome uh, is a little bit smaller of a population at 3,800 people compared to the 4,400 people of Barrow. And it's an old gold mining town. And immediately you'll see that it's going, it looks pretty different. I mean, you already see some greenery in the satellite. There's not no sea ice there. Um, you're instantly met with different birds than you, than you had up in Barrow. Uh, this family of common ravens nested on an old uh, dredging machine right outside of town. But compared to the brown tundra of Barrow, you see clear skies, blue, uh, blue water, and you see greenery, which is not something that you see in Barrow at the time of year over there. Also, uh, when I was standing out looking at the ocean at my back were the mountains, which is again a very different, very different scene than you get in, in Barrow. Uh, both of these areas, though, do have a hard time getting supplies brought in because, because of the area being frozen. So supplies are flown in regularly, which makes them relatively pricey. And then they're able to get a couple barge shipments uh, every year. And this, this photo is just very entertaining to me because the longer you look at it, the longer you realize just how large this barge is as you start to recognize some of the things that are, that are in this photo here, um, such as like the garbage trucks on top, the campers, the, the backhoe and everything here. This is just one of the, one of the shipping uh, shipping barges that come into town each season. Um, again, the terrain here looks a little different. Uh, there's not as much of the, the soft, spongy tundra grass. The, the terrain's a lot, a lot rockier. And when you look closer, instead of it being, being those, as much of the lichen and moss, you start to see wildflowers, which is, which is different than we see in Barrow at the time of year that we're there. And so this allows for even some of the familiar species that we saw in Barrow to see them in completely different settings, seeing golden plovers in the flowers, long spurs in, in these blooming plants. Jaegers are nesting on these little tundra mounds, which long-tailed Jaeger becomes much more prevalent down in Nome uh, compared to it being parasitic and pomeran predominantly up in Barrow. Uh, some of the shorebird species that we see in Barrow become a lot more prevalent when they have these rocky, these rocky uh, terrains, such as Western Sandpiper. And we also get completely new shorebird species, black-bellied plover nests down here. Uh, Wimbrel becomes prevalent down here. Uh, willow ptarmigan is, is also pre present along with rock ptarmigan. And we also get a lot more songbird diversity down here. Um, a few familiar faces from down here in the lower 48 are white crowned sparrow, American tree sparrow, and common red pole. So when you see these species in the winter, and you wonder where they're going to breed. A lot of them are breeding up in this, up in uh, Nome, up in Western Alaska. Even some of our warblers that come through in the spring, such as Orn Orange Crown and Wilson's Warbler, uh, Yellow Warbler and Black Pole Warbler, all make it up there. Um, a, few, a few species that you may be more familiar with if you're from further north or further west than, than I am here in Ohio, uh, Golden Crown Sparrow breeds up there as well as Bohemian Waxwing and Northern Shrike uh, nests up there as well. So unlike, uh, unlike Barrow, not having, not having uh, as many raptors, you do have Golden Eagle present uh, here in Nome. But you also get a lot of these cool, unique behaviors. Um, getting to see things like Wilson Snipe sitting up in trees vocalizing. Uh, seeing a shorebird in a tree is not something that you really would see down here. Or seeing a glaucus gull nesting in the top of a top of a spruce tree is very different than what we're used to seeing here. Um, oftentimes glaucus skulls involve scanning the Great Lakes uh, in January, freezing as you search through herring gulls. Um, similar to how Pacific loons were quite prevalent up in Barrow, you get red-throated loons down here uh, a lot more frequently. And you get, to, you get to watch them as they pair up in these little ponds that are scattered throughout the terrain, similar to how it was up further north. Um, gall life changes a little bit. We're met with mew galls that become a little more common inland. Black legged kittiwake stays a little more, a little more coastal and nests out on some of the islands. Aleutian tern, uh, it's one of the few places on the mainland where you can easily access uh, Aleutian tern. And, and if you are willing to get down and climb, climb down to photograph some of these birds down at water level, which this photo doesn't really show you, give you much of a scale, um, this gives you a little better scale of how, how large this jetty was. 
but when you're down there, you're able to get down an eye level with things like Harlequin Duck, Thick Build Mirror, and some of these Black Lake Kitty Wake flocks that actually had a couple Arctic terns mixed in. And when you're down down at this eye level with these birds, you get to you get to watch them in ways that, that you haven't before. Like if you're watching, if you've ever seen terns dive at a distance where they're flying over your head and plummeting, if you get to sit down at eye level with them and watch them fish or watch as things like the Savin's gall are taking off, you just get like a much more personal encounter with these birds here. Um, one of, the, probably the main reason that the birders want to go visit Nome are the, uh, the rec what, the species that nest over in Eastern Asia that barely cross over into the United States. So they are regularly occurring species, but it's the only place that you can easily um, access them. Things like Arctic warbler or blue throat, species such as bar-tailed godwit, which is the, the longest nonstop migration of any bird. This bird can fly from Nome down to New Zealand nonstop. And no other bird does a, a longer stretch than that without stopping. Um, species such as white wagtail are also pre present. Um, probably my favorite behavior that we got to watch up there were northern wheat ears. This, uh, this particular male was, he was sitting there, uh, we, were, we were sitting there photographing him um, when he and the female took off flying and they were gone for a little, way, little while. Uh, she came back holding this feather and he would sit up on a rock above her she would kind of like parade this feather around, walking around this rock. Then she'd go under, they actually nest like under these rocks. She went in and was building a nest here. And then she would take off again, the male would follow her. And we could always see that he was staying up on the highest point he could find watching over her while she was collecting these. This was likely a, likely a ptarmigan feather that she was finding. And every time she'd come back, uh, bring it back, parade it around a little bit, and then she'd go put it into her nest. And we laid there and watched, watched this behavior for, for quite a long time, uh, quite a lot longer than we, than we realized actually. We just totally lost track of time just being so immersed in this, this awesome behavior here. Um, I mentioned things like golden eagle being present earlier and I intentionally left out uh, my favorite raptor species that is present and known because it's also one of those uh, species that's a lot harder to find in the breeding range up in Alaska is the best place to see it. And that is uh, the Jir Falcon, which is, uh, for those that don't know, Jir Falcon is a falcon species that is the size of a red-tailed hawk, which is absolutely enormous compared to something like a peregrine falcon, or especially something like a kestrel. Uh, and these species, they, they nest around the area too, and getting, getting to see this is not something that you see down here at all. Um, it also wouldn't really be fair to talk about gnome without talking about some of the cool uh, mammals that you get to see as well. Um, per my personal favorite animal, the moose. Getting to see uh, quite a few moose were actually there at the time of year where you get to see calves as well. So that's, that's always cool. I, I would see more moose in a day there than I had seen in my life previous uh, to this trip. And also the, uh, the very, very funny, very awkward looking muskox. Uh, I I just remember telling Brian that I'd wanted to see a muskox really bad and him just like he just kind of laughed and I didn't realize that they were going to be as prevalent as they were um, throughout even with their babies. I really wasn't expecting them to just stand in the road or sometimes if one stood in the road too long another would come and fight them here in the road. Uh, so that was pretty amazing getting to witness that. So now that we've talked about both uh, Gnome and Barrow just getting to just kind of recapping the stark contrast between this tundra, this tundra grass, uh, flat, like soft ground area um, with a much different, much different setting than you see down here in, in Nome. And you can see even just the way we're dressed, like it's a very different, uh, very different environment. And, and both are truly incredible in their own ways. And I hope you, I hope you can see that while both, have, both share some of these really cool qualities, each one is very unique and allows for just incredible birding and photography opportunities that you don't get anywhere else. So, so I would open it up to questions now, but I briefly just wanna mention uh, the next bit. We actually are 
getting ready to announce a birding tour here. We actually have some information on it already, uh, but we don't have a final price yet. But if people are ever interested in going on a strictly birding tour, uh, Eric, one of the other guides here at Saberwing, and I will be leading this tour. Um, hopefully, it, as soon as as soon as we're able to do so. Um, I also want to just mention that our presentation next Wednesday with Rob and Diego Casada about birding in Costa Rica. Um, then the following presentation is birding Guatemala on October seventh with Rob and Maynor. And then Brian's presentation on the magnificent behavior of shorebirds on October 21st. If you go over to our website at Saberwing Nature Tours, then you're able to go in. Um, we have a page all about this where you can go ahead and register for any event that you'd like. And once the presentations are done, they're also uploaded to youtube.com slash Saberwing Nature Tours. Uh, if you know anyone that wanted to catch these and didn't get a chance to before. So with that, now I will open this up to questions. If anyone has any questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. Any questions? Tyler, do you have a favorite experience from your trips to Alaska? Um, I, my favorite experience was actually just the last time I was up there was uh, driving down one of the roads when we found a, found a pair of spectacled eiders, which has been one of my favorite birds my entire life. Uh, we found a pair of them in one of these, it wasn't even in a tundra pond, it was actually just an area where like the, the ice had melted in a way that it created a little pond on the side of the road. But these birds, uh, they didn't really have, they didn't really have any fear of us. Like we were able to get out of the car and just sit there and watch them from feet away. Uh, and then shortly after that, we, able, we had a very similar encounter with a pair of king eiders just down the road. So getting, getting to see both of those eiders like that in one, like one session was pretty incredible and something I'll never forget. How many pictures do you take a day? A day? I, depending, on, uh, depending on what sort of encounter we have, um, I would say 1,500 to 2,000 photos a day depending if we have a really, a really good photo op. Um, I know I typically end with, with about uh, 10,000 photos to go through for the trip. Yeah. Any other questions? It's hard to quantify that one with yeah. day turning to night, turning to day, and, and you really don't even know what time it is half the time. Yeah, in, in Barrow, it really just it really just kind of blurs together. Yeah, you don't really you don't really realize what time it is very often. You you kind of just sleep when uh you sleep in between break. Like if you if you're out shooting and the, the light's good, you just stay out there. And then if it gets cloudy for a little bit, that that's your nighttime. Um, although the birds do still follow a relatively consistent like circadian rhythm with compared to what they would down here. So uh, what we would consider typically nighttime with the exception of a, a few hormone crazed uh, semi-palmated sandpipers, things kind of do quiet down at what we would typically consider nighttime. Uh, a lot of the birds are more approachable then. Uh, you find a lot more birds sleeping at that time as well, despite it being as bright as it was at noon. Any, any other questions? All right. If not, thank you all so much for coming out. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation and I hope everyone else is, or everyone's able to go ahead and sign up for any of the other presentations because they're all gonna be pretty amazing. So thank you guys again.